it changed me because yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming something that I'm not. And I am that dude that walked into a team room that said, don't be on the wall. And I right. looked at that every single day and I let that drive me. And if we lose touch with that stuff, as we get older, we become weak. And we, if we start letting things slide with that, then we'll let things start sliding for others. And we accept mediocrity. It's, 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 it's a slippery it's, it's slope. It's a slippery slope, man. It's a slippery slope. And I think that it's healthy for people to encourage one another as a peer group to be better. I think it's fine. The Black Rifle Podcast starts now. I, I will say this, like, like I'll start this podcast by saying... Cam is a very kind and humble person. And he is like a 100%, like a, just a small town good dude. Yeah. Like pure and simple. Like we went to the Bow Rack and I felt like I went home. Like I felt like I right. was like, like it does home. have Idaho vibes. Absolutely. You know, Wayne is, I feel like Wayne is a lot like Cam too, the owner of the Bow Rack. Really? Yeah. yeah. Like, I think if I had to like surmise what you're talking about and what it's like, just the consistency. Well, you know, like, Wayne is like best friends with Ed Westbrook, yeah, yeah, which is another small world. So the the owner of the Bow Rack in Oregon, which is Cam's, Cam Haynes, his go to bow shop. The small world getting smaller is what Ed Westbrook is retired Idaho uh, State Police uh, captain, and he's also one of my close friends like he i've known him for i mean well over 10 years we met because i had a german short-haired pointer carl who's like my most iconic dog that i've ever had uh ed helped me train carl when i was deploying back and forth and um so we got to be friends ed and Kay, which they're from a uh, town just south of moscow idaho and then they're really good friends with uh, the guys, or Wayne and what's his wife's name? Lisa. Um, gosh, I met her. And please do not listen to this. Uh, she's such a cool, such a cool lady. Yeah. And so I met them for the first time. Well, I've been hearing stories about them for years through yeah. Ed and Kay. Like, you got to go out to the bow rack. You got to check this place out. So I stopped in, got to shoot with Cam. Uh, did a podcast and then met those guys at the bow rack. It was awesome. It was yeah. so, so much fun. Like, yeah. Did you watch that new movie on uh, Netflix yet? Yeah, it's called Old Men. It's uh, uh, Old Man. It's Bill Burr's new movie. You got to oh, watch it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I heard that was really good. But it's his like his statement piece on trying to exist in LA in the current oh, times right, right. as like, you know, one of the boomer generations mm -hmm. or like, I don't know what generation are you? Like, I don't know. Per, like what it breaks down. Like I'm a millennial cause I yeah. fall into that category, but what are you? Are you a boomer? I, I don't think so. I think boomers are like. Boomers 50. are older. Yeah. Like they're like 50 ish. What, what is the gen? Anyway, I'm, I'm, I think I'm gen. Isn't it like, isn't it gen? Z or Y yeah. or something like that, where it's like, if you listen to Nirvana when you're in high school, there's that's the type of that's a generation. Yeah. So I'm sure yeah. that people will correct us in the comments. Probably, so. probably. But but that your generation and the one kind of in the two before you. Yeah, yeah. Like the the post Vietnam um, to the beginning of the G watt. Yeah. Like all those people are super consistent in their like blue collar work ethic. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and it's, it's a completely different breed. And it's funny to see like where we're sitting at now, where I feel like people are just in a constant state of freaking out mm -hmm. and, and panic about what's Everything. going on in the world all the time. Everything. Um, I think, those generations are more just like, this is just the way it always is. Yeah. Um, and are, are just like really steadfast in their desire to just keep doing the same thing that they've been doing. And you can tell by the way they live their life, they're just super calm and happy all the time. They're just, and I wonder if that, if, is that just, is that just a byproduct of, of being that age or is that, is there something different about those generations? And, and like, I don't want to see her back over, like, oh, like, let's, just talk shit on the new generations sure. because but like i think there is something different there well well i think when you're 
I don't know, this is going to make me sound like super old, but I think when you're young, everything is new, right? It's, it, it's almost as if you've gone to a, a, a country for the first time and you're seeing things for the first time. Yeah. So everything's new. Um, you know, the, the Israeli conflict that's going on right now, like this isn't new. It's been going on for, I mean, literally in modern era, you could say, you know, since the Truman era. And then before that, then you've had, you know, obviously people that have been fighting in the Middle East specifically, whether, you know, it's Israel or, you know, I mean, declaring it a country, I don't want to go into the, the history of when and how it was declared a country and the actual history of the politics. But I mean, they've been in conflict for a couple thousand years, <laughs> several thousand. At, yeah. At so, least. You know, if you, I spent a lot of time in Jerusalem, and you go to Jerusalem. Like, how much time were you there? Off and on over the years. Um, I probably spent nine months of my life there. Yeah, take. that's a pretty decent amount. Yeah, I lived in Jerusalem. It's it's an amazing, beautiful city. Uh, you know, Israel's incredible. The entire the entire area is is so rich yeah. with the history of human culture. When yeah. I say that, it's like, I, I like the way, uh, if, if people have the opportunity to listen or read this book, Sapiens, which is the kind of the history of, of human development. The five different humanoid species, right? Did you know yeah. they added a six one? There's no. A, yeah, there's a six one. I'm going to mess it up as far as what it's called, but uh, there was a six one added to it. Um Brian, I'm gonna I'm gonna obscure his name, but Brian Morerscu, the author of the Immortality Key. Oh yeah, yeah. He was talking yeah. about it with Joe on their last podcast. Um, but there's a really good series on Netflix about it's a documentary about the the sixth humanoid species that they found. Interesting. Um, going back, they're dating it at 300 to 250 thousand years ago. Wow. Yeah. yeah so that, so this time that timeline just keeps getting pushed keeps back getting further. pushed back. But anyway. Um, I, I think, you know, being in different areas, so to summarize this, you know, I was, my, my life in the context of going back and forth between Mosul, which was the birthplace, you know, the, the Sumerians or mm. Samara, um, was Mosul, Mosul, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nineveh, which is technically what it was called. And then you, when you look at the Tigris and the Euphrates, and then thinking about how that was the, at least from what we understand, the birthplace of writing. I mean, it was the, where they developed the first known, mm. um, because I'll be corrected, which is the first known place in the world where they had a, a documented system where they could communicate. Um, and it wasn't as if they were doing it for writing letters. It was mainly around how do they organize around their city? How do they organize around their population? Because in order to run a city or run a, a country with tens of thousands of people, the logistics required mm. and just the system and the process. So when they, when they look at these tablets, um, most of the tablets they've found were all based around you know, legal documents like who owns what property, you know, inventories to, you know, how much wheat or whatever it was that yeah. they were harvesting. So it's really around accountability and organization. It wasn't as if they were they were organizing around poetry or something. It was how do we maintain records? Yeah. So we have a look back if in order to judge the following year or to look at things in the past that might've happened to, to provide clarity to, to what's happening today. Um, but yeah, I, I went to, I went to, um, well, I was in Mosul for, uh, I don't know, a year, give or take, you know, in that area yeah. between Mosul and Erbil. And, and then I would jump over and work in Jerusalem so then you're going from the birthplace of organization from civilization to then now you're 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 going into Jerusalem which would be what we would say is the 
the epicenter for religion. Yeah. So from historical and culturally significant places, then you have, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, um, you know, you have Islam, uh, Judaism and Christianity. They're all in this confluence there and they're fighting and changing hands and control because you can look at the different artifacts and you can read as yeah. you're walking through different sections of the city and you can say, this was under Christian control from this time to this time. Then it was under Islamic control from this time to this time. Then it was under. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's crazy. Because it's, or it has such cultural significance, right? Yeah. Like it's from, I haven't been there, but like, I know parts of it are nice, but it's not like it's the most fruitful land that exists on the planet, right? No, I, you know, obviously it's, it, it's, it's mainly desert. Um, it, it has a limited amount of water. I think, you know, that's one of the things that the Israelis have been done, they've been done, that they've done relatively well. They, they, they've been able to organize against a large scale um, industrial and agriculture system by, you know, doing reverse osmosis, you know, pulling seawater in in order mm. to grow crops and feed their country. Um, I, I I just have a profound amount of respect for for the organization of the infrastructure that's out there. It's 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 desert. It's hard. It's a hard landscape, and it's been lived in and on for thousands of years, and it's had a ton of human pressure. So. It's had a rough ride. It's had a rough ride. It's been yeah, ran hard, put away wet. <laughs> yeah. For sure. It's yeah. funny because I started I, I think I told you, but I started reading those the the Casca book series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. This. Um yeah. so this was a recommendation from Mick Skinta, who put he was my chief instructor when I went through sniper school and he moved to Texas. And so it's I've been catching up with him. It's been where's really he cool. live? Uh he, well, as the crow fly, he lives like four miles away from me, but it takes oh, that's cool. 40 mi or yeah, 40 yeah. minutes for me that's to get cool. to his place because there's those huge developments between us and him. But I was hanging out with him. We went and had like a, a Marine day the other day out at this ranch and we're shooting and stuff. And, um, you know, we we're just talking about everything random. And he's like, you got to read this book series called Casca. And it was written by Barry Sadler, who was also the author of The Ballad of the Green Berets, right? right? Yeah, um, I am. And he's, this guy is a super interesting character. But the Casca book series that Barry Sadler wrote, there's 22 books that he wrote. Ah, that's wild. And they're, if I had to classify them, it's like military pulp fiction mm. writing. It's yeah. really, really easy. Like you can burn through these books. But it starts, like, the premise of Casca is this man who starts off as this Roman soldier. And in the story, he is the one that stabs Jesus while he's right. on the cross. And a drop of Jesus' blood gets into his bloodstream, and it makes him immortal. Huh. But it makes it curses him to be the immortal soldier. So he is just living throughout history as a soldier. But in that, they're talking about, as Romans, they're, they're basically sent to Judea as like a kind of a non-combat deployment mm -hmm. type of thing where they'll go and they'll have to do like guard duty and stuff sure. like that as Roman soldiers. And they were talking about Judea was like, like the shit duty, like going down there was, was something that the Roman soldiers didn't like, like they didn't, they didn't enjoy any time that they were stationed down in that area. So coming full circle, it's just interesting to see like, what, you know, I haven't been there. Right. And, and what it's like there. But the history there is just so, so deep. And do, do you kind of feel that? Like, do you get a sense of that? Like, oh, yeah. when, when you're there, you're like, oh, this is old. Like, you feel like you're going back in time almost. Yeah. I, I would go. So, the way that kind of my, my, my days were is that I spent a lot of time running in Jerusalem. It's a great city to run in, especially on um, Shabbat, because Shabbat. Jews aren't driving anywhere for the most part. So there's not a lot of traffic and sections are, are shut down. And, um, I would run the old city and the old city in Jerusalem is it, it's, it's one of the, the most interesting places I've, I've ever been in my life. It's not necessarily as old as you would think it is because it's had, to, it, it, it's had to have been rebuilt multiple times because of war. So 
but it looks mm. like it's thousands of years old. And that you have these like very, very small cobblestone, and I don't know if they're cobble, but they're stone streets. You know, it's the same streets that you know, Jesus made his walk where yeah. he was being flogged and he was up to the point where he was crucified. So you can go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is where they estimate Jesus was was crucified. And then in the same place is the the cave where he was, you know, he rose from. Yeah. So you can go to this place. It's and crazy. You can look at the holes in the rock where they were putting cru- like they were crucifying. Uh, and it's not as if they did it just to one guy. I mean, this was like a a thing that they did to thousands of people. And as you're looking at these things, these these churches and these artifacts, they are they're thousands of years old. I mean, you think about and and really to provide context, I don't know if people understand this, but it was actually Constantine and Constantine's mother that when they when 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 they changed from their previous more pagan religion into Christianity, they made it a a Roman which was Constantine, the, 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 the religion of Rome, I believe, right? Um, that was Constantine's mother, and I'll get it wrong, but I think that was just about um, 200 years after Jesus had been crucified. So you think about 200 years, there's a big time gap between the time that he was crucified and then ultimately when Constantine's mother went out and declared some of these churches as the actual places yeah. that had taken place. and it, it Which is, is interesting that she would do that, right? Because a Roman soldier mm-hmm. was the one that stabbed Jesus mm-hmm. and then the leader of the Romans, mm-hmm. right? No, Constantine wasn't a... He was the king. He was... Yeah. Was he the? But was he in charge of Rome at one point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, I, and then I his so. mom is the one that goes in and makes she these the one, places yeah, sacred. I believe so. I could be wrong. Like, you can it, see how like uh, these all this stuff just has. I, I didn't do any research for this, so just to provide a disclaimer for myself, it's been years since I've thought about this, so I'm providing a disclaimer saying <laughs> most of yeah. what I just said was probably wrong. By the way, it's okay. Because all you got to do is Google and then find out the real the real story. Yeah, regardless, it's interesting. It is interesting, and the place is fascinating. Like I, I was planning on taking my family there this this year. Yeah, in twenty four, actually, not this this year, but I was planning on going to Israel. And um, now I don't think we're going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I think that might that vacation sure, might, might get pushed back a little bit. Um, but you know, I spent a lot of time walking just walking the city and running the city and going to to all the different places which when when i say all the different places i mean there were literally too many for me to recite Mm -hmm. but um any place i could get in to you know read or do research or tour i was i was there because I, i found it absolutely fascinating i mean i went to um Bethlehem for I, I've I've gone to midnight mass in Bethlehem, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and at the Vatican, all three places. And I'm not Catholic, so but I I found it absolutely fascinating to visit these places and watch mm-hmm. as the you know. Catholicism is an interesting religion just in general. I mean, because it has so much of what I would say, the human experience and then history, international history, because it's 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 obviously one of the most influential religions in the in the world. And it has had so much influence on human development, more from ethics, from morals to philosophy. Like it's it's a fascinating religion. And I just found myself in these places all the time where I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm going to go. So you know, I drove to Bethlehem and did midnight mass. So we had to go through multiple checkpoints. 
there were Palestinian checkpoints to get into Bethlehem. And then we went to Midnight Mass in Bethlehem, Damn. which is where uh, Mary, at the church where, you know, Mary, uh, I believe, had Jesus. And then I've gone to that church multiple times and just toured it. And what was that like to be, to be at It's mass fascinating. In place? It, uh, is it, a, is it, <laughs> it uh, like how many people go to something like that on a regular? Is it packed? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's packed. Yeah. Standing room only. It's, it's, uh, you know, y you know, Bethlehem has a, 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 a very large Muslim population. And then they have a, a now smaller Christian population, which would be Catholic in this circumstance. Um, but it's a fascinating, I mean, these are fascinating places that are sometimes, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years old where you know, millions of people have gone through these, these individual places on earth and it has such an impact from a spirituality perspective on millions of people, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in the world through generations of time have been impacted by these one locations. Yeah, And when you go there, and you look at it and you're standing, whether you're Catholic or not, you, you can't help but be uh, moved by the significance of just the location. Imagine. You know, it's not like going to Fourth and Klein for church, right? It's mm -hmm. I'm just making up an arbitrary uh, address. It's, it, it has the weight of what I would say of the millions of people that have either gone there or aspire or think about it. It's a, it's a uh, emotionally significant and it almost creates a gravity that you can feel. Yeah. So yeah. it's a, it's an interesting place. And these are the same, right? If yeah. you go to like um, very spiritual and religious places, um, whether you're Catholic or, or, you know, Jewish or whatever it might be, you can still feel the significance from it. Mm -hmm. You can't, not help. I mean, you might, you, maybe if you're a sociopath, you wouldn't be able to feel the weight and significance of it, Yeah, but you can still feel it. I mean, it's the same in Rome. You go to Rome and you go to the Parthenon or you go to these different locations, you can feel the significance of them. Yeah. And it's not just based on propaganda. It, it It's something there. Well, there's, it's been such a impactful place it's so many important things for our species has happened there um it makes me think of that tesla quote he said i may butcher this the company no no the actual actual <laughs> actual guy um but it was something along the lines of like if you want to solve the problems of the universe think in the terms of energy vibration and frequency and you always hear people like, oh, Arizona, like certain parts of Arizona, yeah, yeah. like they feel so good. Joshua Tree, it just yeah, feels yeah. so zen there. Do you think that places, locations can hold certain energies and or certain vibrations that they have a certain amount of weight to that? Do you think that's true? Yeah, I think so. I, th I think it's also th the, the way that, you would have to unpack that is what's going on in your brain, right? So is it, you know, a combination of environmental aspects? So is it like the view? Mm -hmm. Is it the air? Is it the air quality? Is it the colors, right? You have all these different inputs that are coming into your brain at the same time. And obviously when we look around the world, each and every one of these places has a different look and feel to them. And then I think as we, as we take a look at just the universe in general and the way that we look at uh, gravity and what I would say is like forces that we can't see, you can't help but say there absolutely is a, is a, is a difference between these, these places, which is obvious. And then too, I think we would be remiss not to consider the energy when I say energy, we, we, could, we could even like look at it from gravitational pull. Mm. You can look at it from 
magnetic fields. Yeah. And I'm it's not hard talking to argue about, that the moon doesn't have an effect yeah, on the earth, right? It does. Like that's grab like it's, it's, it's you can it, like, see it when you watch the tides the, rise and fall, man. Like it's proof. Yeah, man. Like I and I guess that's where it's like you you can see you know, the earth is canted at a very specific degree. It's rotating around the sun last time I checked. And are you sure? I think so. I am pretty sure. (laughs) And so it's like, I would be, I think very naive to say that these universal aspects to physics that we are acclimated to through our daily life. And we just like take for granted. Like people don't, Think about gravity. It's not like when you drop something like, oh, gravity, <laughs> you know? Yeah. They're not thinking about it. They're not thinking about the tides and how they, they're moved by just the, the moon itself. And if they're using a map, they have to use declination from a magnetic field, right? So yeah. there are all these different intangible things that we can't see right. that will ultimately impact the way that you feel. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about like, you need to put yourself under a... A, a, a pyramid with a bunch of crystals around your neck. Like, that's not what I'm talking I am, about. I, am, I, I, I know you I am are. I'm saying you need to sleep with a crystal <laughs> in order to live a good life. Like, by the way, man, if it, if it prevents fucking colon cancer, do it. I don't fucking know, man. I, who, you know, who am I? Well, like, some I of this stuff is like, you know, what's it going to hurt? What's yeah, what's it, gonna it, hurt? what's it going to hurt? You know, like, I think what happens is you have these, like, you, you have this negative propaganda around these really wonky hippies that make this stuff almost unattainable because they're yeah. too annoying. They, they make you want to, to punch them in the face yeah. because they have like, you know, flowing linen robes and big wooden beads. And they're talking about a bunch of horse shit. And you're like, yeah. I got to get the fuck away from these people just as fast as I can because they're kooky as shit. And then you're like, well, I don't really have any interest in it because I don't want to sound like you, like an idiot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they're so high, you know, when you're around people that are really high all the time, they're really annoying. Yeah. They're just super annoying people. Yeah. I also thought of another question while you're going on that. Um, do you, people who believe in the flat earth theory, do they think the moon is flat too? Like, is everything flat? I, find, I feel like you would have to like propagate that across other you would have to other things in the universe, right? I, like how I, I think it's just sad. I, I I haven't gone too far down the rabbit hole on flat Earth. I did for I, I guess maybe a few days a couple of years ago, but then I got really sad. <laughs> yeah. I did. I felt really bad. Yeah, I felt bad for these people because ultimately they're so wrapped up in some type of conspiracy that ultimately will not yield them a positive outcome in their lives. Like it, maybe it's interesting for them. Maybe it's fun, but like trying to go out and, and, you know, prove that the earth is flat. Is that really a valuable expenditure of your time? Because they're angry. They're talking about the government. It's a big conspiracy and that you're going to fall off the earth or whatever it is. And you're like, but you could be like hanging out with your kids. You could build a fucking swing set and like, you know, develop a, a more, interesting and and fulfilling relationship with your siblings or your parents. Like you can do a million things that are more beneficial than trying to prove that there's a grand international conspiracy to prevent people from knowing that the earth is flat. And oh, by the way, why would they? What what is what what does anyone gain in going like yeah the Earth is flat what what are they trying to cover like alien bases in Antarctica or some shit like come on man yeah that's well that's that's the question right like what what are you trying to get out of all this like what if if we say the Earth is flat like would you are you gonna sleep better at night <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah are you gonna finally have a fulfilled life I I just don't get it because it, it's like it's like dedicating whether you're right or wrong, it's like dedicating so much of your time towards something that ultimately has like zero effect on your life. I, uh, we were talking about this the other day. I was like, I'm, I'm a hundred percent committed in my life to only creating what I would say is, is positive fuel and then eliminating any and all toxic fuel, which is, you know, toxic fuel is, are the things that ultimately frustrate anger and, and then deter you from creating positive fuel, meaning what's going to propel you in your life in the direction that you want to go. 
that is going to create positive or a positive ROI. And that could be financially. Yeah. It could be emotionally. It could be intellectually. It could be spiritually. It could be a combination of things. But ultimately, discovering whether or not the earth is flat is nothing for me. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a big zero. Yeah. Like I don't give a shit yeah. at all. You know why? It has zero potential for the positivity. True. No. I mean, is it going to affect the way that I fly to, you know, like it, is it affect, is it going to affect the way that I get on my Delta flight and fly to Guatemala? No, it's not. Is it going to affect the way that I interact with my kids? If I'm like, Hey, you know what? The earth is flat. Kids, you're going to have a better life now. No, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything for me. It's actually going to take away any positive that I have in my life. If I'm spending time on things that are going to create a negative effect, it's only going to yield more negative effects. Yeah. That's the way it works. Are you kind of, are you starting to pass on some of this like philosophical stuff to your, your girls, your kids right now? Are they at that point where you can like have these conversations with them yet? No. Cause I, I think about that a lot. Right now, as I'm like on the verge of, um, you know, hopefully trying to start the process of becoming a father, I'm like, it, it's the gravity of of that task is is very large. It's yeah, like, it's like the the desire to really be honest with yourself. Like, am I at the point with this topic? And it could be whatever philosophy, boxing. Like, yeah. are you at the point where you feel like you can be a teacher? Because that's ultimately the role that you really need to step into. Um, it seems like as you raise kids, um, to, to be a teacher in a lot of this stuff. And I yeah. love, I love the Einstein quote. If, uh, you can't explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. Right. So I, I feel like a lot of, like, I have these little buckets where I'm like trying to get enough knowledge in these things. So if, you know, way down the line, um, a child is interested, I can like help that process out, you know, help, help the positivity fuel. And in a couple mm -hmm. a couple of things where like I'm at least confident enough to say like oh I'm, I'm good to teach this thing. Yeah, I, I I think I think more along the lines of if you you have to teach them from a technique and tactic perspective because when they're you know my my oldest she's capable of intellectualizing certain things, but on a deeper on a deeper level. She'll, she'll just blank out. She'll mm -hmm. be like, no, whatever, dude. Because she doesn't have the experience. She doesn't have the life experience in order to fully comprehend what you're referring to. There's no context to it. And even though she might be able to theoretically like diagnose a situation with her brain and say, I, I understand, I don't have any context. I don't have any perspective. I think when you're looking at wisdom, you have... I've looked at wisdom from like a three-legged stool okay. and now I, I've added another leg, but for years I've looked at it as you have to have an education. So, I mean, the, primarily you have to have the intellect in order to uh, comprehend the problem, whatever that is. So wisdom requires intellect, education, experience, and then the fourth is the way, the means in order to communicate that. Mm. Okay. Because wisdom has to be passed on. It can't just be something that you can inherently take on yourself you have to have the fourth piece which is communication and so when you're when you're when you're teaching a child what they're lacking is maybe if they have the intellect but they don't have the formal education the experience and sometimes the means in order to communicate that back so they might have one piece mm -hmm. to that but they don't have the other aspects in order to comprehend something that's truly wise and I'm not putting myself into this bucket of saying like, oh, I have all this wisdom because I, I fully understand that there's multiple other people that have a lot more wisdom than I do. I think as a parent, our job is to keep a, a constant measure as to where they are and then where you can plug additional layers of the information in yeah. and then to not inundate them with things that they can't comprehend. So like... um. My daughter and I last night, we have this physics box that we build every month. It's like this subscription box. And oh, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. And we build stuff together. We're like putting stuff together and then she can build it. And then we're looking at how, you know, air interacts with weight or whatever it might be. Right. Could be anything. Um, she couldn't do the math problem, 
what that looks like. But you can draw the math problem from a physics perspective that would ultimately yield you to what's happening between air pressure, weight, and then ultimately the balance. Mm -hmm. And but she understands how it works, right? So she can't do the math, but she understands how it works. Um, can she clearly define, you know, weight within grams and then, you know, the the air velocity in feet per second? No, she can't put structure and definition around that in order to clearly communicate to others what it means to, you know, run a fan and float a ball up in the air or whatever it might be. Yeah. But she knows yeah, I can. a fan can do that, <laughs> yeah. right? She knows it. So she's missing very distinct pieces. But the point of that entire exercise is like, we get to spend time together building something that will provide her context to the way that things work within uh, the, the physical world. Like I'm a huge believer in physics. I think that physics should be mandatory. I think that people should start teaching physics as early as possible. And obviously you could say that math is, but I think physics can't be taught too early. Mm. And <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. It's like going from um, taking something from an unknown unknown to a known unknown. Yeah. Um, cause it, that's the process of getting, moving something into a consciously competent stage. Um, yeah. it, it's first an awareness that like, oh, I need to figure out how to solve this problem. You know? Well, it's being consciously. So like the, the phases of competency, right? So it's like what, what Logan's referring to is like these, these four phases. So when you go from basically, um, and, and there's, there's, you're unconsciously incompetent at things that you have zero relationship to. So you're unconsciously incompetent. And then what you move into is consciously competent, or sorry, consciously incompetent. So now you know about it, but you don't understand it. If that makes sense. Yep. And then you move into, um, was it consciously competent? Yep. Consciously. No, consciously incompetent, then consciously competent. Then you move into unconsciously competent, which is you don't have to think about it to get it right. So those are the phases, and I'll, re, I'll re, 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 reiterate those. So unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent to consciously competent, which means you have to think about it to get it right, to unconsciously competent. Yeah. Those are the four phases of competency as you start to outline those. And then to, to cite an example, which I like to cite, is learning how to drive. So as you're teaching somebody how to drive a car and we'll use a manual transmission in this circumstance, they don't know how to drive. They have no, they have no idea how to manipulate any of these things. Um, and so when you're trying to teach them, they're consciously trying to get it right, but they still fail at it, which is consciously incompetent. They're trying to shift the gears, do everything they can. Then they move into consciously competent, which is I'm thinking about it, but I'm getting it right. Mm -hmm. So then you get better and you're like, I still have to think. I can't just like do this. You know, I still have to think to get it right. Then you move into unconsciously competent, which means I don't have to think about everything in order to get it right because I've, I've, I've blended in a bunch of subset skill sets that blend into a collective skill set. And now I can drive down the road to the interstate. I can change the radio. You can, you know, uh, second drink. nature. Yeah. You yeah. can drink an RTD. You can talk on the phone, but you're ultimately unconsciously competent at those things. So as we start to look at all the skill sets in our world, and that could be information, it could be philosophy, it could be all of these different things. You're unconsciously incompetent. So our jobs, at least from an evolutionary perspective, from a brain perspective, is to slide at least a, as many things as we can into consciously incompetent. So you know about them, but you're not going to, like, I can't play the piano, but I fucking know about it, right? Have I tried? Yeah, absolutely. I understand, like, the difference in tone and how to, like, you know, get some type of, uh, I wouldn't call it music, mm -hmm. but something out of it, but I'm really unconsciously, uh, I wouldn't even, it, it, I'm, I'm consciously incompetent. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, are you in the process of that at all right now working? Piano? Yeah. No, my daughters are though. Yeah. I could, 
I wish I had enough time. Like there's yeah. all these different, it's triaging on like yeah. all these different levels. Well, that, that was one thing I wanted to ask you with, um, as far as time management goes, like you're obviously a very busy guy between the business of BRCC being a father and then yourself, like how, how are you divvying up a portion of your life right now to where you're like, you're learning where, where you're in an input mode because a lot of this other stuff I'm assuming is, is you're very output driven. Mm. You're, you're doing stuff with the knowledge that you already have. Are mm. you sequestering time right now to where you're just like input? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I've always found enough time to do that. I think not enough. Um, you know, learning is a, it's a lifetime endeavor. Like I, I, I think a lot of people stop or they get complacent, they get lazy, but it's, it's a lifetime endeavor. And I think you, I think people specifically me, I, I don't know what people do, whatever the fuck they want to do. But I think if you don't learn constantly, your brain will atrophy. Mm. And I actually, it's not even, I think it is proven. If you don't use it, <laughs> if you, you don't lose use it. it, you lose it. <laughs> And I try to push myself outside of, of what I would say is normal um, special operations culture learning. You know, I do math problems every day. So like I do math problems every day and I do them for speed. I do them for complexity. I do them every day. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. You like wake up and you do math. It's one of the first things the I do. What is wrong? It's one of the first things I do. Is That's sit. like what kind of math problems? It could be anything. I do like uh, it, typically like it's like more complex algebra for time. So, um, and it's just like providing a, a variable, right? So it could be a really simple algebra problem. That's you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, mm. but then you run it for time. So, mm. like I'll be scrolling through and doing algebra for in my head. Yeah. So I don't use paper. Oh. Uh, so the rules are you don't use paper. You only do them for time and you have to do it in your head. So those are my rules. These are like my rules that I've developed for myself. And it's one of the things I've found that's like, I, 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 I've been, I enjoy it. It's always fun for me. It's always a challenge. I, you know, there are days when I can measure how well I've slept based on how well I do. <laughs> yeah. Because it's one of the first things that will go is your your frontal lobe when you're sleep deprived will start to deteriorate your ability to to do math in any level. So it, you know so it's like multiplication, a static check for you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Multiplication's okay. easy, right? It's all rote memorization. Like we can do that, whatever. But when you're when you're doing like 137 times 137 or whatever that might be when you start to getting into triple and in, in, in quadruple digits, that's when you're breaking outside of what we learned yeah because i think kind of standard is like you know zero through 12 right so it's like zero through 12 you kind of wrote memorize whatever yeah. that is but then when you start getting into multiplication in 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 triple digits or even double digits like 24 times 13 or something like that if you can't do it for time why like it's just a lot of it is just like memorization or it's just like doing it in your head. And it's, it's just a, just a little workout. It's all it is like a little warm up, just a little, like, let's fire it up. Let's get it warmed up a little bit. And I'm going to take this as a opportunity for me to become better. And I'm going to make a pledge right here and right now that I'm going to incorporate math mm. into my daily life Yeah, because it hit me the other day. I was like, I was talking to, um, I've been working with this new, uh, videographer, uh, his name's Torin, and he's this giant Viking man. He's really rad. And we went to the ranch the other day, and he's like, he's asking me sniper questions. So he's like, he's like, well, if if you don't know the range, like, how do you figure it out? I'm like, right, right. Well, there's this equation yeah. that you know, if you got to have at least two known variables to figure out your unknown variable, and then there's a number. But like, I I felt like a piece of shit because I couldn't pull off the the unknown distance mm. formula off the top of my head. Um, and like, I, I was like, what, what's wrong with me? Like, I got to fix myself. You know, I had one of those, those Marine moments. I, was like, <laughs> I, need to, I need to fucking fix myself. Um, so that's like a perfect merging of life where I, I need to get back to some of my roots on some of this stuff as far as, and, and 
that's perfect because that's something figuring out the unknown distance of something. That's something that you need to be able to calculate in your yes. head. Yes. Very specifically. So like, like, l- l- let me just throw out an example there. So like, say, say you're on a rifle and you're overlooking an area that you're responsible for, and you need to take a known variable, um, something that's standard. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so we would typically use like a human torso, right? right. That's what you're shooting at mm-hmm. most of the time. Um, but even that like human torsos are different, right? So like what's something else that's the average person is five ten, Right. So you can just kind of say round up to six feet and then fucking do your math from there. Right. 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 Um, or, or something that, um, it has the potential to be on the battlefield on a regular basis, like a tire wheel. Sure. Right. Like that's, that's pretty common across, across the world. So you, so you take something like that. And then you plug it into an equation, but you need to be able to, and in my opinion, as a competent sniper, you need to be able to do that pretty much off your, the top of your head. You need to be able to not write that down. Right. Right. Like we had the ability in sniper school to like do the, do the math equation, but like we're dumb Marines, you know, so like (laughs) we can, we have, they they give us the opportunity to write it down and get it right. Right. Um, but I think you, to, to truly get to that level of competent, competency uh as a sniper you need to be able to do that in your head because you're not always going to have a rangefinder or 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 you're gonna like you're not gonna have that time you know i was thinking about this the other day uh gosh what was it i was talking to joe and he was telling me about a guy that went out and did tack he does tack every year and he shoots it without a rangefinder it's crazy to me and i'm like that's more crazy to me than what we're talking about like but then i was like well that's a great idea we, we, we should try to shoot tack without a fucking rangefinder. And I'm like, dude, if that won't start dialing your eyes in. Let's because, do it next year. Right? I, Levi I, Morgan, when he, I was talking to him at. Um, that, that's who it was. I think oh, it was okay. Levi. Yeah. Because, I mean, that guy's just lights out, right? Yeah. He's, he's like, he's, he, he's had to do that because he's so good at archery right. now that he has to incorporate challenges for himself to be able to become better, right? I I want to be able to do that. Like I Because I, I rely so heavily on my rangefinder. And, and it and it bothers me. It really does because well, in the moment too, like when, when you're when you're on an elk, like I've I've switched um, my gear o- yeah, over yeah. the years, right? Like, do you have this like uh, this dummy cord attached to your rangefinder so so you don't use it, or you can use it and then drop it real quick? Or now I'm using Dudley's magnet thing, right? But mm-hmm. that snaps and it makes a noise, right. and then like you know if you need to come back up. Like what if that thing moves and then you move and it's only a couple yards between what the elk is moving and then what you're moving. And, but, but then again, you need to like get that, that range finder back up to your eye quickly. What is the best method to be able to do that? And you would really like to just be able to not have to pick that damn thing up at all. Right. I know. I, I, I know all range stuff. I don't know. We'll call it, 70% 70% of the time, and I'm plus or minus five yards because I've been trying to like quiz myself on it. And then yeah. sometimes I'm just way off. I'm like, fuck, I'm like 20 yards off. <laughs> That's like not even close. So there's no way that arrow is going to hit. But it also, if it forces you to be inside the 50 every time from an archery perspective, where you're like, I'm going to move inside the 50. I'm just not going to make a shot. Might be an interesting, it, this could be an interesting problem set for us to yeah, to, like, to explore because trad guys i mean i yeah i guess you use range finders it doesn't matter i mean a lot of those guys are so trad they you know they they don't use range finders that's how trad they are yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but to put yourself in that scenario where you're like there's a bull coming and you draw back yeah you and you don't have the opportunity to figure out exactly where that thing is going to be i think did you cam know? shot his bow at two yards away yeah do you think he needed year? his uh range finder for that he probably did that's like the third time he's done that that's crazy two yards he's so close to it he's did you, did you, kill, you, did you kill an elk this year uh no, no no i was uh i was in support that's right I was in you support were in... i was in support all this fall yeah tell me the story of new mexico with you and re because uh, that's a good one yeah yeah it's um working into like you know we do utah hunts and it's not public land 
doing the public land stuff, like the process mm -hmm. of doing public land hunts, um, is a really unique experience to participate in, um, as a hunter and as an American, you learn yeah. so much and you ultimately end up like experiencing these little small towns in America where like really rad people exist and you're only going to meet them there, right. um, that you're just not going to get anywhere else. So I love, I love the process. And so Rihanna works through hunt and fool. Mm -hmm. which is this company that basically like you can say, I want to hunt pronghorn in like the Wyoming, Colorado, whatever area. Right. And they'll, they'll based on what they know about those areas and those draws and the populations, like they're the experts that can like help you go through the process of getting whatever uh, species that you want to get or location that you want to hunt in. They'll really help with all that. So, so what do they do? You just like, do you email them? Do you log onto their website? I, I don't quite know a whole lot about it. Yeah. So, um, it, it's, it's very P2P. So like you sign up for it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, from, from my understanding, I've only, uh, I haven't signed up for it yet. So this is all secondhand from Rihanna, but, um, you have a conversation with them and, and you tell them what you want to achieve as a hunter and they'll help facilitate that basically. And they'll take all of the legwork out of, um, the process as far as, uh, putting in for all the tags, they just manage all of that. You still have to pay for it, yeah. obviously, but, um, they, they do that legwork for you. So you can go make money to be able to continually do this and, um, track your, your point system and all that stuff. Right. Um, so Rihanna has just been going ham in New Mexico. She's She's had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity in New Mexico. She she drew oryx last year in New Mexico. She she got an oryx. She's like, how many Americans even know that you can go hunt oryx in New Mexico? I didn't know that. No, and it's awesome. Have you had oryx? It's, it's delicious. It's amazing. I have I had oryx backstraps two nights ago. They're fantastic. fantastic. It's a weird flex. But yeah. Sure. Hey, like I you know if I'm gonna flex, it's about the, <laughs> the, the amount of wild game that's in this body uh, on a regular basis. Um, There's a lot of meat that's been in there. Lots just of in meat, general, lots, lots of meat, meat in this yeah. body. You yeah, know, yeah. that's torsos built built from, from to wild fill meat. up with meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we went through Huntful, and she drew in this unit in New Mexico, and you know, people don't don't say what unit it is, and you know, I understand it. Why? Is it, is it because they don't want No, it's just like how people are with Idaho. Like, oh, oh yeah, don't yeah. say how good Idaho is because we don't want them Californians. No, no. I'm like, but the me jig, saying, the jig is up on me Idaho. saying <laughs> Idaho's awesome is not going to change the damn things. The relax. jig is up, man. Everybody knows. Like, sorry. I, I, we didn't we didn't do that. Yeah. Idaho did that. They so, did that. But yeah, we were in Unit 18 in New Mexico. Where is that? Um, it's... I'm, it's like two and a half hours southwest of Albuquerque. -ish. Okay. -ish, yeah, yeah. Right. right. Um, so not not too far from Albuquerque at all. And damn, is there some big balls down Seriously? there, man? Oh my gosh. Yeah. And there's we hunted out of this one small town, uh, which was the only thing. Like they had a gas station and a diner. And that was it. that was the only source of food that you had in this area. Um, and we we parked in some public land and just camped in the RV, went out every day. Um, but it's cool because it's like it's the America that I love to exist in. Every day for lunch, we'd take a break, we'd go to the diner. All the other hunters would come in. You all eat lunch. You all talk about how your hunts going, what areas right, right. you're in, what you're doing, what you're having success with. You know, is there. Does somebody have a bull in the parking lot that you're going to go ask them about? Like, this is fucking odd. Like, this is the best part of America. It's awesome to participate in, I think. And so, but it's difficult, man. Like, the pressure, anybody that's done a private versus a public land hunt, they know how much more difficult the public land is based on the pressure that these animals get and how much, I don't know if smarter is the right word, but how more adaptive these animals are and hard to kill and so <clears throat> you're trying to figure out this process of this area that you've never been in before with these guides um and you pretty much we had 10 days 10, 10 days, days 10 days to get it done 10 days to get an elk um but one of the ones that was taken um he was actually a, a black rifle guy um we saw him at lunch at this diner and like just 
he he got a three. I think it was a 369 sit in water. And this thing was like wider than both of his arms. I was stretched like crazy. I'm like, this, these are public land bulls are yeah. huge. Yeah. And a lot of people don't even know that they can participate in the system and put right. him down there. Like, um, and so that's what I really, you know, the experience side of things is what I was like. I wasn't, I'm not even hunting, man. Like I'm just down here supporting and like, it's just as fun for me. Well, maybe not as fun to be in the driver's seat, but it's really rad to go and experience these things, especially trying to help somebody that you really love and you want to see them be successful. Right. Right. It was tough, man. Especially like, okay. So, you know, hunted muleys a couple years ago in Arizona, like desert terrains, always more difficult because it gets hotter than the wind starts swirling. And so the animals can scent you so much easier. Right. And then <clears throat> You have to deal with the amount of hunters that are up there. And like one time we were uh, walking back to meet up with our guides and we just, you're like, Hey, like look over and there's like a dude like sitting in a bush. You know huh. what I mean? Um, so, so there is that you got to deal with that. There was like one evening hunt. We went to go uh, sit kind of like a little funnel area and like <clears throat> re gets in a tree. And I'm like, I, I look over to my two o'clock and I'm like, Oh, uh, yep. There's a couple guys sitting over there. Good. Yeah. You guys were here first. You know, we took off and, and went and hunts somewhere else, you know? Um, but it was, it's a lot of that. It's a difficult environment, man. It's a difficult situation to be able to do. Um, and that's, what's another thing that's just amazing about hunting in general is all these ups right. and downs the roller coaster of life, man. And, um, and so we're on the last day. Yeah. Day 10, right? Day 10, day 10. Um, and we resorted, um, the last two evenings we set water and this was in part that big, that big 380 ish bowl that we were talking to the guy about. He got that on water. Um, a couple other people got bowls that weren't on water, but, um, so we, we decided, all right, highest probability of success. Let's set water. We had a couple good spots. The ninth night we sat water, uh, Five elk came in, couple good bulls, 15 minutes after dark. <laughs> we were 30 yards from the watering hole. They didn't make it 80 yards in before they smelt us in the dark mm. and then took off. So like, like even then. So like even if they did come in when it was light out, they might have winded us and we wouldn't even gotten a shot. And then we started, we were sitting water also because um, – Chad Mendez was in a unit that was not too far away and <clears throat> he had success on like day seven or day eight and water got a really nice bowl. Um, <clears throat> so we're there and um, Rihanna is like a very, she's like a very strict hunter. She's very good. She's very conscientious of light, shadow, sound, all that stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, but she's got to deal with me. A guy whose, you know, diet consists of, you know, fairly, fairly disciplined eater these days. Um, a guy who's been eating nothing but diner food hmm. for the last 10 days. Right. You know, I, I had to say I had a severe case of flatulence is a, is a <laughs> gross understatement. And so I am, we're sitting water, we're in a, we're in a hide and I am, I'm not super hopeful to be honest with you. You know, I was like, uh, and I didn't, I didn't know it was going to happen. I was like 50, 50 and it was early. It was, it was five 30. Sun was going down about seven 45 at this point. And so, and I'm like half hour before that point, I'm like, I'm tuned in, you know, but I was like, I was in chill mode a little bit. I was reading a book and I just let go of a big one, just a big old fart. I just ripped it. It was loud. It was loud. And then I hear the dun, dun, dun. And Rihanna's standing up. She's glass in a different direction, looking through binos. My fart spooked this bull that was coming into water. He was 10 yards away from us. She was on glass. I was sitting down reading a book, and we didn't know he was there. If I hadn't have farted, Evan, yeah. there's no way that that bull doesn't smell us because he oh, yeah, was going yeah. to walk right past us. So I think I'm the savior of this story and ultimately the success in which because I farted, he jumped back 
20 yards to about 33 yards. And then he like, he just started looking at us. He's like, oh, you spoke to him. And then her eyes just get giant. She grabs her bow, draws back. And I look over right as she releases the arrow. Perfect shot. Double lunged him. He was down in like 80 yards. Wow. And we like, <laughs> can't believe it just happened. The, the, the fart that killed the bull. The fart bull. Yeah, yeah, fart bull. Yeah. So I um I wasn't in the driver's seat. Well, I'm going, I'm going to hunt elk um with a bunch of my sniper buddies in Colorado in a couple weeks. So, rifle. Rifle. But yeah. um yeah, I was in support for archery elk this year, but it was probably the best, one of the uh, best experiences that I've had yet. Well, I mean every elk hunting experience you, you have is, Fun, is amazing. But um it, it was that was one for the history books for sure. Yeah, I I actually really enjoy it. Like I, I shot, you know, Joe and I went to California. I shot my bull first morning. And God, those first morning kills are the best feeling. Well, in, in he, we, we called him into 21, shot him with, you know, my, my bow. And then he ran off. We kind of went and found him a little later. And um, then I was done. So all I did was just glass for Joe for the next five days. Yeah. And uh and I I got to watch all all the stocks. Like so I'm you know, I might be, you know, a couple hundred yards away, but I, I'm looking at bull after bull after bull after bull, you know, trying to help, you know, how where where can we find, you know, good bulls to put him on. And um and I saw some fucking dinosaurs dude like yeah. just dinosaurs and that's the thing is like archery is so difficult you, there's zero doubt I, we were we were looking at this probably 440 huge huge as a nickname bull was so smart and i would watch 440 he was probably 440 wow yeah he was 440 and that bull was so smart he, he was so smart the way that he would lay in his cows the way that the, you know, the way that he would position himself, where he was positioning himself. Using the innocence up. to make sure he didn't get shot. Bro, <laughs> everything about him, like he was not, he was not going to get shot, dude. And uh, you could watch and look at, you know, I spent a ton of time with elk this fall, a ton of time, which I'm super fortunate with. Because uh, I, I just got to spend a lot of time watching them and then just, seeing how they behave because they're i've i've watched multiple cows put in security it's wild yeah. it's you'll have lead cow come in and i've seen this now i don't know how many times but like lead cow will come in to a new area and she'll do seals which or you know which is like one of the things in patrolling we used to do yeah. which is like she'd just be stop still look, listen smell yeah that's what she would do she'd come into an area and she would stop and you just watch this lone cow. Like, what the fuck is this lone cow doing? Mm -hmm. And she's just sitting there with her nose in the air, looking around, not moving a muscle. Not moving a muscle. Mm -hmm. And then maybe 10 minutes later, you'll see another cow. But she's at the 12 o'clock. Second cow comes in, moves to her, and then kicks out to another clock, like a three o'clock. Or six o'clock. It makes it seem systematic, huh? It, it is very systematic. I couldn't help but think watching elk over the last several years and the way that they move and the way that they put in security and the way they, they move out of security. Because when they blow out of a place, like they blow out, right? They, they just explode out. It's the same way of getting blown out of a patrol base. Get your shit. Get the fuck out. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go to a rally point later. They do the same shit. Yeah. They do the same shit. Yeah. And I couldn't help but think the the premise of our patrol activities and what we do, the foundations of it are probably go all the way back to Rogers Rangers and the mountain men and hunters watching. Because if you think about, you know, the the, the premise of infantry tactics right now go back to guerrilla warfare. And traces back to the Revolutionary War and then ultimately Civil War. And then thinking about 
the Roman legionnaires too. Yeah. Like I'm reading that book and like he's he's citing off, you know, how they would work, how their groups broke up in the, in the Roman legion and like legion was a number. And, and so they had all these breakdowns, right? So right. They, they had their their team, their squad, their platoon. They had all of that stuff. Right. But theirs was even, and you know, we're very, this like, a team patrols with a squad in a certain way, and then right, mm -hmm. you fan out and you have different formations, right? They had the same thing, but with the Roman square, right? right. Um, but that, as I was reading back through some of that Roman stuff, I was like, the way that they were saying it was like stuff that was precursors, precursory knowledge to uh, Rogers Rangers and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I was like, and, and then they were saying some of the same stuff too that this was a you know, a byproduct of hunting and the interaction of with animals to work as a unit in order to be successful. And you can spend two days in the woods during the rut and like see this and it's, it's prime example. It's, it is, and it's almost textbook the way they lay in they're they have the way their cows are surrounding and the bulls, depending on where they're at, you know, they, they might have, you know, spikes and you'll have you know your 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 main bull or your biggest bull or the lead bull however you want to describe that but it's almost textbook and cows lay in a perimeter and they have overwatch so then they have the way they're set up their noses are pointed into the wind but then they have others that are pushed out and kicked out so it, it, it's it's without fail every time i've seen and i've seen hundreds of examples at this point you'll have your kind of inner group of cows with your bull and then you'll have a couple bull or a couple cows that are kicked out for overwatch and then early warning mm. every time and you can't see some of them so when you're moving in on a herd you can look at where the consolidation of cows spikes and bulls are but there will be a cow or cows that are kicked out somewhere else that are also looking in looking, listening, and smelling for obviously predators to move in on them. And it's it's textbook. You know, you would have your perimeter set in, you'd have your 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 clocks. So you'd have, you know, 12 o'clock, six o'clock, three, um, and three and nine. And then you might have um an early warning or your perimeter might have another security element kicked out all the time. Well, elk do the same exact damn thing. Like the same thing. And cows will start moving. Lead cow gets up. You know, like if things, if, if things aren't going well, the, the ears start to like orient towards the sound or the mm -hmm. smell. Then they get up and then everybody gets up. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, Something happens, whatever it might be, maybe maybe you'll get a cow bark or some elk will do something and then boom, it's like they all got struck by a fucking bolt of lightning, right? Yeah. And then they're gone. And you won't see them because they're going to be in the they're going to be in the next zip code. So the way the the way you have to sneak in on these things is just absolutely so silent. You wind, you're never gonna beat wind. Like it's never it's never gonna happen. I've tried it, I've failed so many times because I'm, I'm a fucking ninja, man. I could sneak up on these things. Yeah, yeah. Wind, you'll never beat wind. And I, yeah, it was where are you at with so so like with that? Um one of the first guides I had here in Utah, whenever the cows would bark, yeah, he'd just bark right back at them. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Um, yeah, and where are you at as far as your your approach technique goes? Are you pretty comfy, like moving in and calling the whole time, so they just think that you're a you're a cow coming in? Mm -hmm. I just move in. I move in as close as I can get because it. I don't move and try. I, obviously, you can't beat wind, so I just obviously move with the wind. Try to move in as close as I can, and once I'm in as close as I can, if and I've spent it a couple of incredible times this, this fall where I've been, wind has been in my favor and I've been right in the middle of a herd and right in the middle of them. Yeah. And they can't, I'm waiting for the big bull. There isn't a shot. I'm just sitting there 
And if you don't move, there's really, if they can't smell you and you don't move, they're not going to see you. Like yeah. You'd be wearing a fucking clown suit. They can't see color. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was wearing a black hoodie in this ball cap, right? And I'm in the herd. I'm not negating camouflage. I think camouflage works to mask movement. I think that it's an incredible tool. But ungulates, and I'm stealing this from John Barklow. I'm not stealing it from myself. Ungulates can't see color. They can see amorphous blob. So like a black hoodie, they can see that, but they can't tell the difference between what my black hoodie is in a burnt out tree mm -hmm. and me. So they go about their business you know, eating and doing whatever, you know, doing elk stuff. And as long as and you're contrast, not, right? Like, yeah, what, yeah. Which is kind of the same thing mm -hmm. as what you're saying, but yeah, I put my hood on, but if you're like, you're, you're, you're in all this camo, right. But, but you're walking around with just a blank white yeah. face. Yeah. 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 The blank face. Like if you break that up, like I put my hood on and with my, with my uh well that guard. that mustache you got right now what? goes a long way i think for masking <laughs> if anything <laughs> if anything those all could be complimentary be like look at that motherfucker uh, well i think they'll be like, stunned by yeah. um the just overall quality <laughs> yeah. of, of the current womb broom it's wild yeah it is it's it's wild i've i've really really uh i've really got a got a thing going i think my i think my wife really likes it i, oh, I started yeah, growing it I was telling you, I started growing it because my my daughter, she she came to me a couple months ago and she was she was, she she came to me with the idea, hey, let's all dress up as Super Mario and a character from Super Mario. This is my youngest daughter. And I was like, I'm in. That's mustache how, excuse. Mustache excuse. She's like, because she's like, you need to be Mario. And I was like, great, I'll grow a mustache for it. That's easy. I can do that. And she's she she was telling me, she's like, I'll be Peach and Nara can be you know, uh, Luigi and mommy can be mommy, I guess. I don't know. And, um, so I was like, I'm in chips in, let's go. And then both the kids bailed out because they wanted to do their own Halloween costume. They're like, but we want to just make up our own thing. We don't want to be confined by corporate greed and culture or whatever. I'm like, fuck off. You know? All right. I want to be Mario. So I'm going as Mario full, got the full outfit. Got the got the hat, the gloves, the whole Are you the gonna, whole thing. You got magic mushrooms to grow with. <laughs> yeah, yeah get, to get big. You got a big magic Does that make mushroom. you wonder if they like? You just look at Mario, arguably one of the most popular video games of all time. Maybe, yeah, probably. And this character mm -hmm. that eats mushrooms and then they get big. Yeah. Was that random, you think? Probably. I, I have such a hard time believing that. I don't that. know. I I think that if you look back at Super Mario 1, which I played when I was a kid, do you think it was just like a random circumstance and where people were, were just playing video games and going, oh, I don't know. Like, let's use the, you know, let's use the, turtle shell and this thing and that thing I, I don't know i i just can't imagine the guy that he's like a kind of uptight japanese guy that built that game so i just can't imagine him why why do you say he's uptight how do you how do you, why just do you the way it? he looks I've seen <laughs> you're just judging him based on, judging him based on his pleated, <laughs> on the his pleated look. front on his doctor i feel like he couldn't have been that uptight he design video games that's real, fair maybe i'm know. thinking of nintendo my I, my i want to believe that they were just like getting whacked out that, on shrooms that, and then, yeah it was like his way of putting it out there into the world for future right. generations that there was this kind of hidden meaning behind the mushrooms you yeah. know same thing as santa claus what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Santa Claus? <laughs> santa Claus taking Man, mushrooms? I mean, you, you know uh, just way the, there's, you know, the, the, none of this can be proved and it's all speculation, but there, like, there's a couple of theories out there that Santa Claus was um, out delivering mushrooms and really know, a lot of the, the Amanita mascara mushroom, the red and the white one, oh, that's where Santa Claus got huh. it. Like he has to magically like get small and go down a chimney and then. What, what do mushrooms do? They give you a good ride if you're good. They give you a bad ride if you're uh, bad. So it's like this like gift 
right? Interesting. Depending huh? on how you are as a human, right? Whether or not you're going to get a good gift or a bad gift, right? And we take that and we form it into you know what fit whatever kind of cultural mode we want it to be in. But you can, at least for me, I started reading some stuff. It was just like it was just like little things, but you know, my your brain just runs with it. And you're like, oh yeah, I could totally see that that lore and that culture of trying to pass on this idea of um this is what happens when you eat mushrooms yeah. and this is a ceremonial thing. If you've been good, it'll be a good experience. If you've been bad, mm. it'll, you know, be filled with black coal. Yeah. I I don't I don't doubt that. I think I think there's been a lot of people throughout history that have eaten a lot of mushrooms just in general. Because if you think about how... The, it's the, an the, impossibility it, that they haven't been. Yeah. Because uh, if, if you just think about the trial of trying to figure out what's edible and what isn't edible, and then all of a sudden you're like, I found these mushrooms that, you know, take you to another dimension and then you're you come back to your little little, little tribe and you're like what check this out guys like i know this isn't calorically something you want right. to eat but well why not though like if you're a if like you're it doesn't a, provide any nutritional value is what i'd say well yeah but if you're a, if you're a nomadic species um and you're moving across vast amounts of lands with the herd and all of a sudden there's a thunderstorm and these things sprout up off of the ground, of course, and it's yeah. a potential food source, of course you're going to go interact with that. Oh, man. Right? Can you imagine if you're just like cruising around and then, oh, hey, we're going to we're gonna pick a bunch of mushrooms and you eat too many out in the middle of some like thunderstorm trying to chase. Well, you got to imagine, like there was both the, the amazing example of that happening and like a really bad, like people right. dying from, from, poison and toxicity, but like the premier mushroom guy in our culture today, Paul Stamets, um, claims that eating a large dose of mushrooms cured his stutter. Yeah. I've, 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 I've seen the documentary. Yeah. They've got a great, he's got a great documentary on Netflix. So, the, so these he's example, obviously been on Joe's podcast yeah. a million times. So those examples have to be out there throughout history. Um, yeah. uh, Another theory, speculation, yeah, but that the original Greek mythology was based off of, or in part had something to do with mushroom culture and lore, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> for whatever reasons, mushrooms have a tendency to sprout up after thunderstorms. There's, really? Yeah, there's something, something that happens environmentally, but um, that's when they say that's a really good opportunity to go look for mushrooms is after a thunderstorm. Mm. So you can imagine being a primitive people right. and all of a sudden this crazy environmental thing, thunder and lightning that you can only interpret as a God, God yeah. Zeus happens. We survive. Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden these things come up out of the ground and you have and you eat them and you have this crazy psychedelic almost holy experience potentially right from eating these things you can't help but tie story to these things that are happening environmentally that all of a sudden provide this thing that all of a sudden like how can you can, if you didn't like just put yourself in the shoes of someone tens of thousands uh, 30,000 years ago and you're just existing and you're primitive and how, how else can you interpret these things that are happening that you're in the middle of a lightning storm and then all of a sudden things are growing up out of the ground that are causing you to have godlike experiences of course you're going to tie story to that of, yeah, of yeah. course you're going to develop means and method to pass on knowledge about that thing because it, any anything related to food or health like you're going to want to pass that knowledge on to your kids in some way shape or form right well like mm -hmm. eat these ones don't eat these ones let's make this let's give a metaphor to this mushroom so that like we incorporate story so that we can remember it and pass it on it's not so difficult to imagine like well you know, i put myself in the shoes of someone like that like oh yeah of course i would create fantastical stories to be to pass on knowledge to future generations of my offspring because I, I don't want them to have that 
toxic or, you mm. know, bad mushroom trip that I had, you know, like it, it just all of a sudden it kind of makes a lot of sense from a predator standpoint. Well, you, what was the first psychedelic you took? Was it ayahuasca or did you do psilocybin before that? It was that? psilocybin. Yeah. Yeah. How long ago was that? Um, so that was, uh, that was right after the first river trip. What year was that? 16. 16. Yeah. yeah. By yourself or with somebody else? Uh, I was with someone else. Um, it was here in Utah and it was, yeah, that's what I, I appreciate about the people and individuals that introduce us. Like it's typically like, Hey, here's a small amount. Mm. It, there's never an exchange of currency. It's always just something that's put out. Um, I think a lot of times it just, you know, it finds you when you're ready for it or whatever the, mm you know, kind of woo woo thing you want to say about that. But, um, someone from the river trip, um, Jess, mm, I think it was Matt, but all right. Somebody, somebody from the river trip gave me a couple <laughs> mushrooms. Yeah. Of course those river guides. Yeah. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I went up to, and this is this first experience that I had paved the way for everything mm -hmm. that I've participated in since then because of how profound this first experience was for me mm. um and, and overall funny and amazing like it's it's one of my favorite memories of my whole entire life but so i went up to uh there's a have you been to white pine lake mm. up here up, up oh. the canyon um it's an awesome hike uh google it it's three miles out three miles back right um and you can camp in between and stuff like that so um this girl flew in we're going camping for the weekend. I've got right. I've got coffee, a bottle of wine, and some mushrooms. Like we're about to have a great time. You know what I mean? So we go out, we hike, and on the way out, we go out early in the morning. We run into a family coming back, and they're like, "Oh, we stopped at this. Um, we found a little pond." And this morning, a moose came into the pond, and we were like waking up, and this moose was splashing around. I'm like, "That sounds awesome." Yeah. Um, where was it? And they kind of described it. I didn't have a lot of hope that I would be able to find where this pond was. Um, but as we we're hiking out to this trail, like I just knew like, they're like, it's a really steep hill on the left side. And like, it's kind of three quarters of the way, but that was really the only directions that I had, but I ended up finding this pond and it was like up on this plateau, like completely secluded from anyone that would have been walking in this area. So we set up the tent, whatever, go out to the lake, come back take the mushrooms. Um, I mean, it was one of those situations where um, it, it didn't kick in right away. Mm. You're like, is, is, is anything going to happen? Um, and, and you don't, and I, I had, I remember I made, it was the time I was still rocking that GSI French oh, yeah, press. Yeah. I think I had, that was like my primary camping yeah. coffee for probably a decade of my life was right. that thing was went everywhere with me and now it's an arrow press but i made one of those drank half a bottle of wine and all of a sudden it was kind of that perception shift to where all of your senses feel different everything like you uh, everything's heightened yeah you feel like a two to three X person, you see visually better, your colors are more vibrant, smells are greater, your your senses are are more. Uh, it, it's just really enjoyable. I I remember, you know, the first time and many times since you're like, why can't I exist like this all the time? Mm. And it's something um, you wish you could do. Uh, and then the girl I'm with is looking at a tree and I can't remember exactly what type of aspen or whatever it was, but the leaves, they're like the teardrop leaves and they're light green on one, say, and dark, dark green on the other. And they were like fluttering in the wind and it was like giving aspen, this like yeah. this little visual display, right? She's like, oh, this is so cool. You know, she's in right. it too. And she's like, this looks so cool. The wind coming through these trees, right? And where we're at, there's like, big giant mountain range and then like a drop off on the other side and, and she says like i wish there was more wind and for whatever reason i just turned to the mountain 
And I yell at the mountain. I'm like, if you will it, <laughs> bless me with more wind. And like, I shit you not. It was like, <sighs> like this undeniable gust. It gives me goosebumps thinking about it. This undeniable gust of wind just pours down off the mountain. And I was like, I was, I was stunned. Like I, I was like, I, what just happened? Like, did I just communicate with nature? I and maybe it's coincidence, but that was enough for to get me hmm. hook, line, and sinker, and, and to explore that side quite a bit more. It's interesting because as as you talk about it, you know, I've I've had so many different conversations with vets around just the use of, of recreation and therapy based psychedelics and specifically psilocybin. And <clears throat> they're just now starting to reintroduce psilocybin specifically around, well, I shouldn't say around the veteran community, but the reintroduction has been through terminally ill cancer patients mm -hmm. and that reintroduction of psilocybin back into our culture as a form of therapy has been because it's helping people that have essentially terminal illnesses deal with death. Yeah. And, uh, I, I can't help but think that the, the, the psychedelic itself or the, the psilocybin, because there's multiple different strains of, of mushroom from what I understand. Um, it's overwhelmingly positive from the veteran veteran health and psychological health perspective that it's helping it's overwhelming like the data is 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 there in the sense of anyone that i've talked to mm -hmm. and that's shared their experience has said it's one of the single best experiences of their lives yeah and um i i just i can't help but think like one of my criticisms and questions is from the from the veterans affairs and veterans health they're more than willing to to prescribe any and all pharmaceutically you know in, in ph pharmaceuticals to us like right. any and all like uh, marcus latrell was telling me at one point he was on like 16 different medications or something like that however this substance that is illegal in most states and decriminalized in some that is obviously helping people. You have to break the law in order to seek clarity or 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 help. Like, are you a conspiracy theorist in that regard? Like, what what's what's your what's your feelings? Like, how do you look at this? Um, I mean, I feel like it's a lot of the other things that have transpired. Um, when it comes to the federal government, which is, um, it, it's capitalist space. Like we tend to implement things that can be profitable for institutions. Um, there's not currently a super good way to be able to profit off of mushrooms. Henceforth, mm -hmm. it hasn't really found its way as a primary uh, ingredient in veterans therapy. This is changing right now. Um, you can now, if you are a veteran, you can go to the VA and you can get ketamine treatments. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Um, I was talking to one of the guys, um, out, I went to the patrol base of Bate event, mm -hmm. which is a nonprofit based off of, uh, my good friend, Matt Abate, who's killed in Afghanistan. Um, and it's a nonprofit, but it's also a location where you can go and they host different types of events. So mm -hmm. I went out there for the fight club event that it had when like the jujitsu and Muay Thai for a few days and talked to, talk to these guys, mostly just about everyone that was there was an infantry Marine. And at some time over the G Watt war, and I was talking to one of these guys and, um, he goes in, I think he said once or once a week or twice a month, something like this. And he gets a ketamine treatment, mm. um, completely taken care of by the VA and they, um, host you and, and so that's something that you can do um ketamine versus 
mushroom, something that comes out of the ground. I haven't done ketamine, so I'm definitely not the expert on this. But what, why is that prioritized as a therapy method versus something else that we have all this testimonial evidence across time that's really helped people evolve and grow? Why is that being prioritized versus something else? If not because, well, we don't have ways to to replicate it, to be able to be used in these in VA type settings, mm. but we can, we have the means and method to be able to have people come in, um, take a nasal spray of ketamine and do therapy that way. That to me is better than nothing, right? Or, or it's better than just kicking people on pills, but I don't know. Again, I said, I haven't participated in it. Um, and, and from my understanding, I think, I think MDMA is getting passed uh, to be able to have their therapeutical use this year or next year. And then psilocybin is um, on its path, on its path coming after that. But who knows? I mean, a lot can happen in that time frame. And, and then does it, you know, the question comes back to, um, will this ruin it? Um, I'm, you're already seeing different types of psilocybin, um, products start to pop up on the really? market and mm -hmm. gummies and chocolates and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't have the right answer for how this should be developed and implemented across a national mm -hmm. scale, but I do think it is, it is better than a lot of the other things that we have been using over the last decade and the result of the GWAT. Yeah. I, I can't help but, think that there should be, at least where my disappointment is, there should be a significant amount of research that's being driven by the VA into the community because we're we're facing an epidemic. Like it's, you know, veteran depression, veteran suicide, veteran under and unemployment, um, and now, you know, increased cancer, you name it, right? So, you know, my, my uh, close friend, Josh Rousen just died of lung cancer. He's never been a smoker in his life. You know, 27 years in special operations and, you know, diagnosed with cancer. And then he had an accelerated track to essentially, you know, I mean, he, he died a couple weeks ago. And most of the people, and going back to his funeral, most of the people that were there, the, the Green Berets and the former special operations guys that were there because Josh was in, Ranger Regiment, he was in SF, and then he was at the at the agency. So he had a very specific uh, professional development track. And all these guys are, you know, now we're in you know our 40s and 50s. And um, I, I would say 100%, everybody's struggling. 100%. We're all struggling with different things. And maybe that's just the, the plight of man in America mm -hmm. could be part of that struggle. But they're what we're struggling with is finding our footing post service and how kind of how do we fit into the country? How do we fit into the culture? I I think as I get older, I made a post about this, which is I've realized that I I, I never I never left the team room, right? So I started this company. I never had to go out and make it on my own kind of a thing. I always had you and Matt and Jared and all the other guys that were here. I never left. I never had to leave the team room. Yeah. But my friends, my peer group, which I won't lie, nor will I cover any of it up, which is like those are the people I care about. They're very, I mean, they're they're my family. And I'm and I see, and it pains me to see the the amount of struggle that they go through, but the resource that they get is so conventional. It's so pharmaceutical and conventional, whereas there, there needs to be a resource. It's like consolidated information for a group of guys that are really, they're struggling. It's like, well, one, first and foremost, you have to eliminate the sugar out of your diet. Like number one, like that's the single most important thing you can do. I think in your life, right? Like today, it's like, like drinking fucking 30, 30 ounces of Coke every day is not making your brain better. It's not making your body better, but you have to cut out fucking sugar. And I hate to say it guys, but you got to cut out alcohol. Mm. It's like if you eliminate sugar and alcohol out of your diet, 
and concentrated on like, okay, now I'm going to limit what I would say is my, my, my calories into just like what I would say is nutri- nutrient dense calories and concentrate on working out, eating the right thing. Like you've just taken care of a huge percentage of what you need to do. But man, I see guys and they're like, you know, half into a fucking bottle every night. They're eating, they're eating like they're still 18 years old in the barracks. They're, you know, drinking Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola and all these other things that are like really sugar dense trash. And at 50 years old, you can't do it anymore. Like you can't. And then the VA is not backfilling with what I would say is like a, a unconventional and conventional approach to solving the problems. They're just not. No. Like they don't, they have an uneducated staff and don't get me wrong. Like there's a ton of incredibly like heroic and, and amazing people that work in the VA, but having empathy is not the same as being a subject matter expert in the way that we collectively deal with things. Like, just not like we struggle with alcoholism. One of the biggest things that we deal with as far as the GWAT community is alcoholism. And that's, I mean, purely that is one of the reasons why I don't drink anymore because I, I feel like it's not as if I, I, I feel like I'm inclined to alcoholism. I just feel that there's such a problem with it within my family. I can't, I can't participate in it because I have to lead by example in the context of if anyone's following me in any circumstance, not in social media, I don't give a flying fuck about that. It's look at what I'm doing. You don't have to listen to what I say because I'm fairly uh, kind of an idiot most of the time, but it's just, if I don't drink, no, other people around me won't drink. And I'm not going to set a precedent that it's going to be socially acceptable for yeah. people to like tip a bottle because it is, I think, if you, if you eliminate alcohol, you eliminate sugar, try to work out and get some sleep, at least you're setting your body up for success to where you can succeed. Yeah. Like try to rebuild the the entire process. Um. You know, so I think, and then if if you can start to fix your diet, your, your your nutrition, your fitness, you know, your nutrition, your exercise, your sleep, then you can start to like work on the brain, your emotional and psychological state. But I don't think you can work on your brain until you're until you fix like some of those other things. If you're drowning yourself in alcohol, I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. There's that that book, um, Vander. Vessel cork or um, I can't remember exactly, but the body keeps the score. Mm. Um, that <clears throat> and it and it not and not even maybe just in combat, but a lot of the training that infantry guys have to go through. Um, I may not be a hundred percent correct on this, but I believe that they, while we were in, um, they changed the formula for standoff distance for explosives because. They were, they were finding um, mm. trauma to the, to the brain as a result of being too close to some of these blasts. But like, you know, I was an assault man. Mm. Matt was a breacher. I remember this story you told me um, prior invasion. And they just, they gave you guys like all the explosives that you wanted to play with, um, to develop and practice with, right? Like how many explosions that you think you're around? Um, the impact of shooting a 50 cal, um, how much that can potentially harm your brain. And we don't really talk about that at all. But imagine a world in which when you got out, the, one of the first things you went and did was you went and got a brain scan. Mm-hmm. And just imagine if we we knew, like coming out like, hey, physically there has been damage done. You need to do certain things to start repairing or, or living a certain way to have a good life. If, if we got that right out of the bat, instead of no information and no dialogue, no discussion about the potential impact that just explosions can have on your brain, send you out into the world and, and it starts having profound impacts. Um, maybe just that coupled with alcohol, um, Maybe that alone is a recipe for disaster mm-hmm. for people. But we are t- 
too strong and we have too much ego to like, so like, <clears throat> no, something's wrong. Something is potentially wrong. And, and it may be something that like it, you, you can't I, control I, it. I disagree. And this is where I hold accountability into the general officers. Like, like I was 26 when I went to combat, like 26. How old were you? 18? 23. Okay. Like the generals suppose like, and, and this is where, I mean, I'm going to go on a fucking rant here for a second, which is where are they? Where are they? Where are they right now? Are they on a fucking podcast? Are they talking about holding the veteran affairs accountable? Are they in Washington, D.C. lobbying for, a, con, for conventional and unconventional solutions to our health problems? No, they're not. Fucking Millie is talking about like how bad of a president somebody else is. They're not. They didn't care. They never fucking cared. Yeah. They I never fucking that. cared. They didn't, you know what they did? They went to West Point. They went to Annapolis. They went to every one of their, their, their little fucking schools. They got their, their stars. And this is where I would go back to Mattis and all these other guys. They don't have platforms. They're not out there beating the drum for us. They're not out there saying like veterans need a, a year of transition time. They need full body scans. They need to make sure that they're going to be healthy. They need to make sure they don't have any precursors to cancer. They need to make sure to take care of these guys because those guys took care of me. I've never heard a fucking general on any news network say, we've got to take care of these guys. I hear them talk about their own shit and how great they were because they had really shiny shit on their uniforms, how fucking cool they are. I don't hear them talking about, we got to take care of the men. Yeah. I don't hear them going to Capitol Hill and talking to Mitch McConnell and Pelosi and holding them accountable for their fucking political decisions. I don't because they're selfish, entitled, ego-driven fucking assholes. That's why. It's guys like you and I, if we don't take care of our shit, if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't take care of our peer group, they're not going to. Yeah. They're not. They're going to abandon their men just like they do every fucking day in America when they prove that it was never about the men. It was never about the mission. It was about them because they have the ability to make them make the difference. What the fuck does E5 Logan Stark? What can you do? Can you go lobby in the Pentagon? Can you go call your buddy that you played golf with over in the fucking, you know, Crystal City? No. Because you don't know any of those guys. They know all of them. Yeah. They know all of them. That's Dan. We went to the we went to the academy together. That's Steve. We we used to fucking blow each other in the, you know, the country club or whatever. No, they don't give a shit. You know, they're more concerned with going to work for Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, name the military industrial complex corporation, get their next fucking chairmanship or whatever the fuck it is, making sure that they can make a few hundred thousand dollars a year plus their retirement. They can look back in their fucking shadow box, talk about how fucking cool they were. But the thing that they're not going to do is they're not going to take care of their dudes that took care of them. They're not going to. And the reason I say that is the overwhelming percentage of general officers are not out there holding people accountable. You never fucking hear about them because they're all retired, living a fucking great life on their little boats, playing fucking the back nine of whatever country club, fucking back slapping and sucking each other off. That's what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And you, you just have to, like, uh, that's a very depressing reality, but but you're right. And, you know, I we've both felt that in scenarios downrange where people are yelling at you in, in an environment <clears throat> about things they shouldn't be yelling at you about, um, completely neglecting the overall mission and success of what we were trying to do downrange those same individuals are the ones that you're talking mm -hmm. about that really they didn't give a shit mm -hmm. about us then and they don't now but where is our smedley butler where where is our 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 leadership on that front and 
you can't help but ask like, what, what is, what do we do? Like, what is the answer? How do we take this overall negative reality and, and fluctuate it with positivity? Like how, how do we go, how do we, how do we make sure that, you know, the Josh doesn't happen for, for the next guy that we're, yeah. we, we have early indicators and we're, we're checking things that are <clears throat> going to help people potentially not get to that point where they're in an early grave. Like my buddy, Jordan Laird right now is, <clears throat> I think he's, I think the nonprofit is defenders of freedom, but he's, he's in Dallas right now. Um, <clears throat> and I know boot campaign does this as well. Um, and, and I think a lot, I think this should be, I'm going to say it right now, just watching my dear friend, Jordan Laird. He was, he's one of the guys in, uh, the documentary I did for the 25 mm -hmm. that's gotten a dialogue. Um, and I caught up with him earlier this year. I mean, man, he went through hell. Um, but right now he is in Dallas as we speak and he is getting the complete brain scan, cognitive testing. And right. it's, he's texting me, he's sending me his results and a lot of this stuff, um, he is brain functionality is below average John, mm. and he's like, I am getting confirmation on something that I suspected was wrong as far as traumatic brain injury goes. Mm. And there is a, a sense of relief and then turning the corner on that and working towards, Oh, well, there are things that can be done um, in order to live a good life, even though this is a reality. Right. And, you know, I look like our career tracks between him and I were almost identical. Right. And so it's like, well, fuck, do I have fucking traumatic brain injury? And, and really, I'm like, do I need to go get a brain? Yeah, probably. Probably. I probably do. Yeah. And, and, and as a hope of, you know, trying to spread positivity and look solutions on this stuff. Like we can't rely on these leaders that we mm. knew were shitty leaders. Then we have to rely on ourselves. We have to take care of our own tribe. And it, and I think saying, Hey, you need to go potentially get a brain scan. And there are plenty of nonprofits out there that will take care of this mm -hmm. for you. It's 15 grand to go through the program that he's in right now. And he's getting, he's getting the display. They're putting him in the fucking spinny thing. Yeah, yeah. He's like every test He's just doing it for two weeks. Um, and I'm just so happy that he's doing that, you know? Well, I think that's the, the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, don't push out toxic fuel, which, you know, to use Sean Evangelista's tagline, right? No one is coming. It's up to us. Like nobody's going to help. Yeah. And the only thing we can do is we can help, which is, sorry, man, like I, I'm going to have to tell you some hard truths. You, you can't drink anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you can't fucking drink tons of fucking corn syrup and sugar. You can't eat like shit and drink like a fucking fish, dude. You can't do it. You're 40 plus years old or whomever it is, right? You can't do it. Yeah. You got, you got to sleep. I think, sorry, dude. I you, think guys will gravitate towards that. I, I think the same guys that found success in the military, like the, what the military is in a lot of ways is like, you can't do that anymore. You can't, you can't be nasty. Can't that, be that's nasty. like all like, that's what we call each other. Like, don't be nasty. You can't be a nasty fat body. People, people always say like, oh, well, I got to be more diplomatic and I have to be more, you know, PC and you got to accept for people. What you as like Evan Hafer. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, dude, whatever. It, 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 I'm not going to, it's like, sorry, if you're fat, it takes away from your, your health, man. Like it takes away from your ability to enjoy life. And there's a reason why that means you have a, an excess of caloric intake. You shouldn't be fucking increasing your caloric intake past what you're expelling. You shouldn't. Yeah. And that becomes a problem. So it's just like going into debt or anything else. If you, if you're walking around with a couple hundred bills on you, dude, that means like you're essentially putting yourself into debt on an interest rate. You're going to have to pay with your heart. Sorry. Yeah. It's just the way it is. And so when you're talking to people, it's like, I don't really give a fuck anymore. Like I, I, I was, I was talking to one of my buddies. He's like, dude, you're a fucking fat ass. You need to fucking like, I don't need to come to your house and start flapping the, or slapping the donuts out of your fucking mouth. Like what is going on? And he's like, 
no, I know. And I'm like, don't feel bad for yourself. Don't be a fucking coward. Like, suck it up. Yeah. Like, stop eating like a pig. Stop. Like, just stop. Well, it's easy. I'm like, it's not fucking easy, dude. You know what? Like, you should embrace hard shit. It feels pretty good every now and again. It also increases your confidence to know, like, I might do a 24-hour, 36-hour, 48-hour fast because I'm a fucking fat ass. That's okay. You know why? Because you're going to do yourself good and you're going to start to build confidence in yourself knowing that you have power. You can bring back the power, bring back the courage into your life by not putting any and all things yeah. that you want in your mouth. This instant gratification in a land that's just a sea of caloric intake at any point in time. You don't have to drive two blocks without getting something deep fried or some you know, sugar-filled, deep-fried, like, delicacy that ultimately could probably be your your entire day's caloric intake. And what I'm tired of hearing is, that's too hard. And I'm hearing it from a bunch of fucking dudes that are hard. Supposedly hard. Yeah. You wore, used to wear this green hat and would stomp around talking about how badass you are, but now you can't keep a donut out of your mouth? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It, it's, it's bullshit excuses that we wouldn't have taken from them if they were no, on our team i would have like f- fucking annihilated them if yeah. they were on my team like like straight annihilated them every day yeah and maybe we just need to think of clint trial a little yeah. bit more every time i like i think about situations like this like i i'm my mind just immediately goes to clint trial and like a dude that has like given so much and had so much taken from yeah. him and every time i see him i'm like i'm like what are you doing like you're like you're like thick yeah you're like stuck i'm like what are you been doing he's, he's like, fit he's like you know he has <laughs> no like, legs but he's like figuring out how to walk on his hands for fucking pt and i'm like he's this, jacked guy, this now. guy never stopped Dude. being fucking hard so, and like if you look at him doing this like i just like I, there's never yeah. been a, a human that i'm more like i sit down to talk to him like the wisdom is just flowing and it's yeah. like coming from him towards me and i just like if that dude like looks like a fucking stud in his situation like there's just no like there's just no bullshit excuses to be had from anybody else yeah that that's the point you know and i i don't want to make it sound like it's a um you know some type of motivational speech but in a way it is it's like hey man there's a lot of friends and a lot of people we know that you're either not here or they are missing very significant portions of their body that prevent them from doing anything and honestly that's that's one of the biggest motivators for me it's like you know, John Blank lives with pain forever, like forever. And he was cut down in his early 20s. And okay, I got to remember that. I got to remember Clint and John. I got to remember, you know, my friends that aren't here. I got to know that when I get out of bed and I, I need to suck it the fuck up, it's like, yeah, man, I got to work out. You know why? Because these things don't work. That's pretty sick. Pretty rad. Right? That's legs fucking, are pretty rad. Legs are awesome. Like, it's pretty awesome. And so when you're thankful for your legs, let's start to put things into perspective. And what I hear is a lot of fucking complaining from people. It's like, oh, it's so hard to keep a donut out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, really? Is it? Is it really hard? I don't know. You know, you think that you think that John might trade you out for your fucking nice legs? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, now you're so fat, you're having like all these different knee issues or whatever it is. You think John might want your knees? I'm pretty sure John could fucking keep donuts out of his mouth. I don't know. Well, do you think this is really a, do you think at the root of this, this is really a purpose issue? Because like, if we just use getting into the military as an example, right? Like it's not hard to not get fucking cake in the chow hall because you're purpose driven towards making it through this thing. Right. Um, Do we, lose enough purpose after we get out that that like switch in us or the the higher purpose the seriousness Mm. of the discipline that we know that we need to have instilled us in us on a day-to-day basis um being disciplined in those moments of weaknesses or like for me i get it worse like i got off nicotine which fucking sucks like that is a hard 
motherfucker to kick, man. It's super hard. And like, I'll note, like I'm very cognitive of like, when are these times I want to like break, right? <clears throat> well, yeah, when do yeah. I want to break? When do I want to snap this? And I, and I think a lot of addiction is the same to where you're like, you, you have these, mo- it's, it's, it's about not letting these moments get to you to where you're like, and it's what anger or um, like, oh, I don't, I don't want to deal with what I'm dealing with right now. So I'll use this as a vice mm-hmm. um, to put my energy into not having to deal with this thing mm-hmm. or in times of uh, kind of bliss um, when I'm like, I'm really happy and I want to like, let the oh, good yeah, times yeah, roll, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. let the good times roll. Yeah. Like I just, so like, I'll just have, I'll just, I'll just have some nicotine. Um, those are the times when I like, I have to be disciplined about not having one of those things. Um, and that's, it requires constant work, but it, it's also like, I, I'm like, this is going to kill me someday, or, or this is going to drive to something that's going to kill me. And like, so there's a seriousness behind the desire to maintain that discipline to not interact with that thing. Right. Like we need a mm. seriousness of purpose integrated into our lives to be able to have the discipline to say no to these things, to not be fucking nasty. And, and I think that, I think <laughs> I that we, I think we just I love fucking that lose term that. so much. I know. I forgot. Like I fucking it's so it's such a good, it's like, you're nasty. nasty. You're just a nasty. I, God, <laughs> I love that term so much. Like when you used to just be able to like, fry people for being like nasty. Well, it was, man, to say that to somebody, like it meant, it, it yeah, meant yeah. It something, was, dude. Like I remember like, you're fucking nasty. Like saying that to someone's <laughs> face. <laughs> it was like the worst. It was like, it's like being called a chow thief or something, like just the worst, it, right? Yeah, like, like that, that hurt. Yeah. That hurt, you know, it made you change. It made you change the way you were. Yeah. Um, it, it, it was, it was a fucking sin to be called that. And, and you didn't just let that one fly. Like no. You used it when it needed to be used, you know? When I used to just demolish people. I, and not as if like I'm hard, you know, re, like looking back on it and some romanticizing it. It's, you know, my job was to, you know, keep dudes alive. Well, if you can't solve a complex problem, like the most complex problem you've ever had to solve in the shortest amount of time frame at VO2 max, I'm not doing my job. And if your VO2 max is not like fairly exceptional, dude, I've, I've failed. So it's like, you got to take that stuff personally. And I don't, this, this entire culture and social pressure around people to just accept people for who they are yeah. is dog shit. It's no, you don't have to, you know why you should as a, as a culture, you should be trying to push people to become better, better humans. Like you should be like, yo, hey man, like I noticed like you're about like 20, 30 bills overweight as a friend. I'm going to say like, what's going on with you? Like if you're like, if you rolled into my office and you had like a sixer of Coke, like Coke regulars, when you're like jamming those things down, I would, I would have a conversation with you and go, you're on a one road, you're on a, you're on a one road trip to like diabetes type two, man. Like yeah. this is not going to work out for you in any way, shape or form because it's just kind of logic and it's, it's, it's institution and common logic. Now excess amounts of sugar and caloric intake are bad for you. Why do we have to pretend like it's okay. I wouldn't do it. If my daughter was like, I'm going to eat this entire quart of ice cream. I'd be like, no, you're not going to do that. You know why? Cause it's not good for you. Like things in moderation. You have a Coke. I've seen you maybe have three Cokes the entire time that we've known each other. Maybe four, right? That's fine. You know, I, I'm never going to say anything cause you, you, you work out, you eat in moderation, you keep like a healthy perspective, a Coke now and again, that's fine. And this isn't like a beat up. I'm not trying to beat up Coca-Cola at all. It could be Pepsi, Coca-Cola, anything that's got like copious amounts of like sugar in it. It's just, we all know that's not good for you. So it it, would be like anything. If you came in here and you're like, Hey man, do you want to huff some gasoline with me? I'd be like, no, are you fucking stupid? Yeah. It's just, it's just not being purpose driven towards your health. 
not being purpose driven towards having a good life. Right. Like we let go of this, this value that we have for our lives. Right. And, and we're like, we, we become okay. We're like, Oh, it, it's come back. Or like, Oh, I've got a couple of excuses now. Or like, well, I have kids. And so I really can't do this. It's like, what happened to that, that person who went through boot camp that was like in love with discipline in love with what discipline had allowed them to become like, where is that? Why, why, why do we not have the strength to be able to instill that in ourselves and find a way to do it for us? Like I, I, my method is like, I'm super hard on myself. Like you're talking about the, the dietary stuff. Like there's been two times in my life and the, that when this has happened, I like, I, I make drastic changes, but like if I've ever felt a jiggle yeah, on my body, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you're, you're riding down the car and like Ooh, you hit oh. a bump and I'm Ooh. like, there was Ooh. a jiggle. I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God, you nasty <laughs> pussy. Get back in the fucking gym. <laughs> now, and it, like it changed me because yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming something that I'm not. And I am that dude that walked into a team room that said, don't be a pussy on the wall. And I right. looked at that every single day and I let that drive me. And if we lose touch with that stuff, as we get older, we become weak. And we, if we start letting things slide with that, then we'll let things start sliding for others. And we accept mediocrity. It's a, it's a, it's, it's it's a, a slippery, it's slope. A slippery slope, man. It's a slippery slope. And like I think that it's healthy for people to encourage one another as a peer group to be better. I think it's fine. Like, I mean, I call my friends when I see them drinking too much and maybe, you know, whatever, dude. They think I'm an asshole. That's fine. I got no issue with it. I, I am. Like, to be fair, like, I am, I, like, I'm an asshole, but I'm also like, I want some of these guys to be around for a while. I don't want to, like, come and scoop them out of some rehab facility or have to do something for them. Like, I don't want to go to their funerals. Like, dude, I've gone to too many funerals the last couple of years. Yeah. Either it's weighing yeah. on me. Like, I don't. I went to that I memorial. Like um, I went back to Pendleton earlier this year and I was in a no drinking phase. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, man, I'm going back to Pendleton. I'm going to see the boys. Yeah. Like, how am I not, how am I going to get through this? Like, how am I not going to have a few brews? You know, like. I was thinking about that. I was yeah. thinking, like, how am I going to go up first Sergeant Hill with all those fucking crosses and not have a fucking brew? Right. You know what I mean? Like, have one for the boys. Pour one out. Like, how yeah. am I not going to do that? And I showed up, um, and I got in late, and everybody had tied one on the night before, yeah. you know, as you typically do. And I showed up. I'm like, no, I'm not drinking, you know? And it was like, oh, you sure you don't want I'm like, no, I'm not drinking. You know, and then, and then the next day, like, oh, like everybody feels like shit and you're yeah, good because you're, good. you're not drinking. Yeah. <laughs> and my buddy, he calls me a month later after that. And he's like, I haven't had a drop. I'm like, how do you feel? He's like, I feel pretty fucking good. He's like, I drank again. But yeah. like, that was fucking good. And I'm so, I'm telling you, like Jericho is another one that just did it. Like, he's just like, I'm going to not drink for 90 days. Like. Just even instituting these little things, other people are going to pick up on this and it's going to have a ripple effect of positivity across our community. Like we have to remember that stuff. Like if you worked yourself into any type of uh, community within the military that was a, a selection of a selection, like a chosen few that worked together, like you had standards, and those standards were talked about on a regular basis and they upheld those. Like, why are we not instituting new standards for ourselves? Why are you not talking about your own personal standards to yourself on a regular basis? If I'm not doing that, like I just eat myself alive. It's it's like, I, I, I'm kind of thankful for that because I'm fucking terrified of living a life being nasty. Well, yeah. I think that most people should be terrified of being nasty. And I think that, I, I I explained this to my wife a month or so ago. I said, you have to build in confidence targets in your life 
that allow you to build confidence, the mm. things that you know you're going to be able to do and that will also make you feel good about yourself. And you have to build those in on a repetition that you do every day because you have to you have to create opportunities to increase your confidence. So when something happens in your life where you need confidence, you got to reserve. So it's really easy. It's like, hey, man, I'm just not going to drink. That's an easy confidence target for a lot of guys just to fucking bang. You know what? I can go to a social event and just drink soda water with lime because people think that I'm drinking vodka soda, right? They, nobody's asking me if I want a beer. Yeah. More importantly, who cares? Yeah. I'm not I'm not in high school. I don't care if like, people think I'm drinking or not. Like, I don't even like the taste of most beer. I don't care. I can drink soda water all night long and I can get up next day at six o'clock in the morning and like go for a five mile run and feel really good. The other yeah. night I was out till like two in the morning or some shit. Well, I didn't have a drop to drink. So I woke up, I was already tired, but at least I wasn't hung over tired. I could still go to the, go to the gym. I could still function <laughs> and I could still function intellectually, which is really important. Like, I don't know how these guys deteriorate their brain in the context of alcohol, not work out and then try to function the next day. They can't. So my confidence targets are super easy most of the time. They're like really fucking easy. It's like, don't drink, you know, get get a, get any workout. Doesn't matter, dude. Even if it's just like a hundred air squats, a hundred fucking pushups, like it'll just get, get something on the books. It's like, don't drink, get a workout in. And like, bro, I'm already there. Like, it's like I've already kind of pre-built some really yeah. good confidence targets in. It's like, go to bed a little bit early so you can get some good sleep. Like get some good sleep eat well. Okay. So these are all the things that are like really easy, man. It's really not that hard. Yeah. Like if you don't want to eat like shit, don't buy it at the grocery store. Eh. You know, my diet starts in the grocery store. That's what I tell people. If it's in my house, I'll eat it. I just know I will, mm. but I don't buy it. So it just doesn't even cross my radar. And so it's like sleep, work out, like practice a little bit of discipline just a little bit goes a long way. And then I know like when Saturday comes around or Sunday, whenever I have like three or four hours, I can get like a really heavy squat session in. I can sit, you know, I can sit in my, my, my uh, ice bath for, you know, an extra five or 10 minutes. I can take more time. And I, I don't have such a, like a, a, an obstacle with knowing like, oh man, I've got to like climb this mountain of psychological intense every day or whatever it is. Like, dude, I feel good. I haven't had a drink. I work out every day. I get some good sleep and I don't eat like shit. Mm. And it's like, oh, well, I can fucking tackle some other shit then. Interesting. Well, well, it's really interesting coming from you too with someone who's achieved what you have on the business scale. So do you think it's, and maybe it's not one over the other, um, but do you think it's more important to have like big long-term goals that you can push towards or like these little um, confidence You got to have goals. You yeah. have to have a strategic direction. And then I think you have to have goals and objectives. And then I think you have to have techniques and tactics that feed into those. Yeah, I have techniques and tactics that feed into what I would say is like a daily confidence that flows into more of like a long-term goals and objectives. So I just know based on my schedule, like I'm not going to be able to get an hour and a half workout in every day. I just know it. Yeah. Okay, dude, got it. I, I've come to terms with that reality. So now it's like, all right, well, I'm going to get what I can get when I can get it. And I'm not going to beat myself up about it. You know why? Because it's really important for me to be engaged in different meetings. And it's really important for me to be engaged with my kids. And it's really important for me to be engaged with my wife. Okay, I'm going to get what I can get. But there will become a time in my life where I will be able to get an hour and a half, two hour fucking workouts in a day. And I love it, by the way. Mm. I love thinking about that as like a goal or in my, I can work myself into my life where eventually I will get into a position where I can get an hour and a half, two hour workouts a day because I love working out. I love it. Like I love going for long runs. I love going out and like and crushing myself. It's fucking awesome, but it's just not going to take a priority right now because I want to get my kids up for school. I want to read them bedtime stories. You know, I want to get a really good night's sleep like those are all the things that are really important to me. So it's triaging your time and making sure that it, I'm just not being a lazy piece of shit. I'm not just blowing workouts off altogether. Like yesterday I woke up in Eugene. I slept like shit. 
woke up in Eugene, Oregon. I've been on the road for like three days and I like didn't want to get up out of bed. I, I fucking kicked myself out of my, out of my bed. And I, I was like, I was pretty stiff. Like kind of, for some reason, I think it's just like dehydration and travel and stuff. So I was like, all right, man, like you just got to like knock out a bunch of fucking squats. And so just started squatting, just doing air squats. And I was like holding on to like some handle so I could get a deeper squat, you know, and then eventually like a warm up and I get into it. And then once I'm warm and I'm ripping, man, like I just keep doing, keep doing squats. And I called uh, Mike Glover on the phone and I was doing push ups and squats. And I was talking to Mike, like, cause Mike fires me up and he's super fun to talk to just to see like how his neck's doing. Cause he got neck surgery and he's been, he hasn't yeah. been able to feel his right hand or some shit, but like, I didn't want to do any of that. <laughs> like, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to stay in bed. I wanted to sleep. I wanted to like yeah. get up and drink coffee and, you know, be kind of a slug. That's what I felt like doing. But I was like, when I feel like being a slug, the first thing I do confidence wise, when I feel like re really being a slug, when I feel that creeping in, that's when I have to do something like push myself. Cause it's like, oh, I feel like a piece of shit. Okay. I'm just going to knock out a hundred squats. Interesting. You know how long it takes to knock out a hundred fucking air squats? Like well, on a, on a low end day, like three minutes, man, it's yeah. nothing. It's freaking nothing. It's like three minutes out of your day, but you know how much fucking better you feel? Yeah. Yeah. This, um, so this is interesting because you said something earlier that I wanted to come back to, um, about doing your math problems. Yeah. yeah. And you said you do your math problems for time. And I, <clears throat> I have this like video idea that I'm, tinkering with in my head. Um, but it's basically titled speed for speed forces focus. Right. And so you're doing that intrinsically in a couple different areas of in your life where you feel this slugging creep in, you'll force focus into what you need to be doing through speed. Mm -hmm. Um, and implementing that both in the physical and the mental sense. Yeah. Um, how, how much value do you think that has as far as like, okay, let's, let's start a timer or let's, yeah. let's prioritize this speed or focusing and funneling something into doing it as fast as we can. I think there's a ton of importance for that because it puts a time standard on it. I think measuring yourself as well, like, like problems, whatever it might be, because it, it also, let's say you can do like whatever, we'll call it 30 math problems in a minute. I'm just throwing yep. out an arbitrary number. That's great. And then tomorrow, don't do less. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can do, you know, whatever, we'll call it 60 air squats a minute. That's cool. Tomorrow, don't do less. Like the whole point of this is to be better and yeah. to have the ability to measure yourself to improve. Because if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Ah, that's good. So it's like, you got to measure it and... Like I measure everything. So it's like, if I can't do 10 pull-ups, dead hang pull-ups, I got a problem. You know, if I can't do, you know, it's like 50 push-ups or some shit. And, you know, if I can't do 50, it depends on like injuries or you know, shit. Because sometimes I'll have like a left shoulder injury or an elbow injury that will prevent me from doing shit. It just flares up here and there. Or I've got an Achilles issue. Like if I'm running less than an eight minute mile I, or more than an eight minute mile, I got a problem. Yeah. Like I, I need to be able to sit down and go, okay, I need to run a three mile in a seven and a half minute mile. I know that I have to do that. So if I can't, most of the time it's because I've been nursing an injury and I'm coming back to it. And I know that I'm going to sit at like an eight and a half, nine, nine and a half minute mile depending. Yeah. And then I got to work my way back down to like seven minutes. I yeah. got to. Yeah. Interesting. So it's like this speed forces focus, which then lead ways into this concept of standards, mm -hmm. right? And standards are fucking everything in the military, right? Like, oh, yeah. whether that's shooting or yeah, that's fitness. And like, so we don't, but I, I, I think we're onto something here because there's two things that we rarely do um, as we age, and that's put a stop yeah, watch yeah, on yeah. something and then develop our own personal standards yeah. for certain things. And I'm not saying like, well, I do crossbow. Like I, I, I understand yeah, that right, you're, right, you're doing right. a wad. That's great. Um, but, but I'm talking about not just the implementation of that yeah. on a fitness standard, oh, but yeah. like, how, how do we take that and apply it to like I, all these different things where oh, performance yeah. is the 
objective where that, performance that's a, that's a, is the outcome. That's a really good point. Cause like, I know draw time, right? Like I think about like push-ups, pull-ups, three mile run, like sit-ups, like just standards yep. because we've, we've been built around standards all the time. Like I know all the standards that I, that I grew up in. So when I deviate too far off those standards, I start getting really salty mm, at myself. Yeah. So like, I know I got to have a sub second draw. Like I know I do for inside the seven yards. I got inside seven yards. I got to have a sub second a zone hit from a concealed carry position. I know that if I don't, I got a problem and I got to go like build my reps back in and make sure that I'm there. And that's why like, Every now and again, it'll be like a month, two months before people see anything in my social before I like go back to shooting because <laughs> my, I got to get back on if, the range. If you're not there in suck. your head, you you're you're not up to the standard that you have, correct? And you live by. I yeah, I 100 percent live by a, a set of standards that I have to have. I really like this because it's like, well, now this becomes fun yeah, because yeah. it's like, all right, how what other standards can we set for ourselves and start to layer on top of each other and have all these bricks right right in our foundation right that'd be cool we should we should start developing those like we were talking about with like brent we'll sit yeah. down with like soft lead and fucking plug in some standards yes i'm in the middle of one right now okay right. um so the, there's a go this is specifically fitness um but <clears throat> On the fitness side of things, you know, the fucking air bike is like, oh, the, the, fuck God. those things. But like thing in, in a good way a because machine, they're, they're yeah. awful. Well, they're awful. You know, working with uh, Aaron and Mike Blevins over there at, at Nonprofit in the space program. I've been doing the space program um, pretty consistently for about 18 months now. And it's just, it's, it, it's the most in-depth, rigorous programming that I've ever seen. Huh. Um, so I, I have a tendency to steer towards that. Um, but I love the simplicity of the standard that they have with the air bike. Right, right. 10 minutes, your body weight and calories. Oh. That's the standard. Oh yeah. That's great. It is straight torture. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't successfully done it yet. And oh, it drives it. me nuts i do Drives 10 minutes that i can't so do it. my standard is like a warm-up on that thing which is 10 minutes 100 calories so it's like i got to do 100 calories in 10 minutes i know that's the standard that's what i get done for me right that's like my internal standard that i've developed over the years where i know like it takes me a minute you know it takes me a couple minutes to like get into the rhythm but then i gotta start really ripping on that thing to get even 100 cows in 10 minutes yeah so for you what are you at 185? Yeah. Yep. So you're basically putting out twice the output that I would be at 158 pounds right now yeah. as of this morning. Yeah. I'm so you I'm, be, a, I'm in fairly good shape. Yeah. You know, I can't. I haven't hot. done it yet. Man. Yeah. Like it drove me fucking look nuts. Well, hey, let's go. Let's yeah, get full out of circle. Here. Full Don't circle. Don't be nasty. Don't be nasty. See you guys.